and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Futsal 868 Corner Talks. My name is Geoffrey Edwards, host, moderator, and president of the Futsal Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Futsal 868 Corner Talks is an online meetup series where global sporting professionals share their experiences and perspectives on the fastest indoor growing sport, growing indoor sport in the world, futsal. For this month of April, Futsal 868 Corner Talks will host Futsal in CONCACAF. This four-part series aims to sensitize and educate all to the sport of futsal in the Confederation. Our guests will assist to provide an in-depth look at the game of futsal in their countries and regions in the Caribbean, Latin and North America. Today, in episode 47, we continue with part two of the series. Our guests is Mr. Chris Fernandez, Director at Futsal Canada. Let's welcome Chris. Good day, Chris, and welcome to Futsal 868 Corner Talks. Uh, Jeffrey, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me on uh, on your fantastic show that is growing week by week and providing people with a wonderful taste of not just what's going on in Trini Futsal, but also across the CONCACAF and international regions. So it's my absolute pleasure to be here, mate. Thank you very much, Chris. And, you know, it's, it's a joke because when I first did the, the, the ad, I put Fernandez with a Z instead of an S, which leads me to the question, who is Chris Fernandez? Tell us more about yourself. Well, as everyone knows, but the uh, the S is Portuguese, the Z is Spanish. Uh, but, you know, every time I go to meetings and people had never met me and they just see this very fair skinned guy, they're like, we're looking for Fernandez. I'm like, yeah, that's me. And uh, so they always have a good laugh at that. And uh, I guess I look uh, I look more Wayne Rooney than uh, Luis Figo. I'll leave it at that. But, uh, yeah, ultimately, I've uh, been involved in futsal for now uh, about, I think, 13, 14 years, uh, just uh, going across the world, uh, covering tournaments. Uh, building tournaments here uh, domestically in Canada, uh, helping other league and club owners uh, get established and just trying to, uh, you know, spread the word of futsal across the world as uh, like yourself and quite a few other guests that you've had. Uh, we think it's the greatest sport on the planet and deserves to be played by everybody worldwide. Most definitely. And you said it quite, you said it quite well, one of the greatest sports in the world. And that leads us to your position as the director of Futsal Canada. Tell us, I would like to get your journey in Futsal from a player perspective, administrator, and something a lot of persons don't know. You're also a commentator. Give us some, some insight in terms of you, in terms of all three hats worn. Well, no problem. I, I do have to say I, I wasn't a player except recreationally. I will never pretend right, to be right. any high performance guy. <laughs> I never had the skills. I, I always like to joke if futsal was played with a hockey stick, I would be the next Falcao. But uh, unfortunately, it requires, uh, you know, two proper working feet, which I do not possess. But uh, I do like to play recreationally. Uh, I just I find it, again, the greatest sport on the planet. Not one of them, the greatest sport. I think it's just phenomenal in every aspect of it. But, you know, in terms of administration, um, to be honest, we initially started um, or reinvigorated, I think would be the proper term of Futsal Canada. As Futsal Canada was around uh, since the 1980s, uh, when you had uh, a big part of the western part of the country, BC, uh, known as British Columbia, uh, was the real hotbed for futsal in the country. And you had uh, great people like uh, Charlie Cazetto and all these other phenomenal players and builders across the board. Uh, Carlos Mateus uh, in from Brazil, now back in Canada. A lot of real builders established it. And throughout the 90s, uh, they came to, uh, you know, build a little bit better, uh, developing with the FIFA system once, you know, they left the FIFUSA. Um, and ultimately, it kind of went dormant in the 90s. There was really no interest uh, from a soccer federation standpoint for developing futsal. And, you know, for myself growing up in Toronto, uh, we're one of the largest uh, international cities on the planet in terms of uh, you know, being multicultural. Um, as you know, we have the biggest, you know, Caribbean festival on the planet right here called uh, Carabana. And uh, if you haven't been, uh, you know, you have the invite to come on down and bring everyone too. But uh, pretty much in a nutshell, you know, we, we just went around and we saw all these leagues um, and they were typically, you know, ethnic specific leagues, you know, you had Spanish league, you know, you had an African indoor league and the AMF, uh, was doing you know quite a good job because 
frankly, there was nothing FIFA related here at the time. And it just got me to thinking after, you know, traveling to different World Cups, I've been to pretty much every tournament, uh, whether it's a European Championship or World Cup since 2004. And I always kept running into people who were into futsal. And I I caught a game over in, in Portugal, and it just ignited me and said, this could be one of the biggest sports in North America if built properly. Um, And then, of course, you know, like everybody else, you know, first getting into futsal, you do your research and everyone was saying this is a soccer development tool. Well, it's not one thing or the other. It is its own sport. and, And I'm adamant and entrenched in that belief. But it is also a development tool for soccer if that's what people want to utilize it for. And so when you look at futsal and you see, you know, the the players, everyone talks about, you know, Ronaldo and Messi and Neymar and Ronaldinho, you know, and everyone from Brazil pretty much that started off playing futsal. And it got me to thinking, futsal is not a coincidence for developing top soccer players. It's a science. It's a formula. If you play futsal, you will be a better technically, uh, a technically superior player than if you do not. Um, And ultimately I said, well, you know, you got one benefit of this helps, you know, the soccer community, which I think in the United States and Canada is the big sell because, you know, there is a very uh, big, you know, pay to play model over here that people are so focused on. But more importantly, it is its second sport on its own. You know, it has its own rules. It has its own regulations. It has its own competitions, its own tactics. It's a completely different sport. Um, So I got involved after um, you know, and just reinvigorating Futsal Canada, which was dormant for, like I said, a, a good decade. And I just wanted to create essentially a news portal initially where we would just share news from clubs, tournaments uh, all across the country as best we could. And then a bunch of the leagues came together and clubs and said, you know, why don't we reinvigorate further and, you know, go back to what we were doing in the 80s and 90s? And doing essentially, you know, membership and and joining together, helping each other with tournaments, helping each other with coaching, helping each other with officiating development and all sorts of competitions. So, you know, we just sat there and, you know, we really worked on it. Um, We didn't have, you know, a hundred page constitution with, you know, all these, you know, pieces of red tape and hurdles in your way to stifle the sport. We just wanted to grow it because we love the game. Um, and so we developed national championships. Uh, we developed, uh, you know, ref courses. We developed a whole bunch of stuff um, and put, you know, in, in our opinion, you know, the best futsal people in the country together to make it happen. Um, and so that's kind of how it came from an administration side. And then I went over to the World Cup in 2012 in Thailand, uh, realized just how connected and, and how close the futsal family is across the world. Uh, everybody wanted to see Canada develop and welcome me out to dinners and conversations. And, you know, we continued chats from there. And then afterwards went to Colombia for the last World Cup and uh, just kind of accentuated on that. Um, and ultimately, you know, here we are today, you know, trying to grow the game, uh, trying to get the team qualified, uh, you know, to the World Cup. We're, we're really hoping that that happens in a couple of weeks. And so ultimately, uh, the last you know, portion of your question was as a commentator and, you know, uh, you know, the old joke for my guys, cause I, I grew up in the Caribbean part of Toronto. So, you know, we had a, a lot of our Jamaican brothers over here. They're like, man, you talk fast for a white guy. And I'm just like, Hey man, that's it. I'm just rapping with you guys. That's how, that's how I'm doing it. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I ended up doing a little bit of radio work, uh, was a play by play commentator for the Canadian soccer league over here for three seasons with Rogers TV. Um, and I've done journalism, you know, written, um, you know, over with, uh, you know, various outlets. Uh, and I've been very fortunate uh, to have traveled the world. And, you know, I've gone to four World Cups, you know, four European championships, uh, a couple of futsal World Cups. I did the Copa America two years ago. And you know what they say, the next best thing to playing is talking about the game. And there's nothing in the world I love more than traveling to a different place for a futsal or, a, you know, a, a football tournament and just meeting different people from around the world engaging in new culture, trying new foods, hearing new music, new sounds. Um, that's what, you know, that's what gets me up in the morning. It excites me. Uh, when I go to bed, you know, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of different ideas all the time, uh, much, you know, to the chagrin, my girlfriend does not like that at all. Uh, but, you know, I got that little pad with the notes and, and I just love the game and I love traveling the world. And that's, uh, you know, pretty much me in a nutshell. You know, interestingly enough is that many persons are listening to you and saying that's Joffrey as well, because I'm the same way. We could hear the passion in your voice when it comes to futsal, trying to find new ideas to be able to grow the sport in our jurisdictions, in our regions. 
and most importantly, having that pad next to us that where it is we get up with a brilliant idea, we write it down. I find my source of inspiration when I walk, run, or even um, a little bit of F1, a TMI um, on the throne. So I have a I have a pad there as well. <laughs> Can't so blame you. Took, you got the pads, you gotta put them down. You gotta put it down. Totally understand. <laughs> um, but yeah, I wanna say thank you very much for, for speaking about more yourself. We're gonna take a short break, but when we return, we're gonna speak more to Chris as regards to futsal and kinda. What does that mean? Uh, the, the, the land of, of hockey. Where does futsal sit in? We'll be right back. You're watching Futsal 868 Corner Talks on a Sunday, as always. Part two of Futsal in the, in, in the in CONCACAF with our friend Chris Fernandez from Canada. We'll be right back. So that was the first friendly of the men's national futsal team against a Venezuelan select. As always, with sport, it unites communities, it brings cultures together, it brings people together. I want to say thank you very much to our sponsor, Lucas Aid, who keeps Futsal 868 moving. So before the break, we had we had Chris, Mr. Chris Fernandez, introducing himself, who he is as a player who he said he has two left feet, <laughs> an administrator at Futsal Canada, as well as a commentator, and his passion abounds. Now, in this segment, we want to dive into Futsal Canada and their work in development, sustained growth of the sport of Futsal in the northern, in the northern uh, region, um, in, in that of CONCACAF. Chris, tell us what has Futsal Canada been able to achieve thus far when it comes to developing the sport of futsal in a country that is known for hockey? Well, it's a great question, especially since both sports interlap over the fall, winter and spring seasons. And ultimately, with futsal in Canada, the strong point, as I alluded to earlier, was the AMF organization, formerly known as FIFUSA. Um, and for years, uh, you know, they were a dominant force here in Toronto uh, and in Montreal, which, you know, are currently the two largest futsal hotbeds in the country. Um, but they've uh, lost, uh, you know, some steam over the years. So we created FIFA leagues um, in Montreal, in Toronto uh, and across the two major provinces, uh, which is Ontario. Uh, and Quebec. Um, and that's just in terms of geographic size and, and population. So, you know, that's where you kind of needed to market it. 
And over the years, we've just kind of, you know, had, you know, small clubs who were either just men's teams with very high quality players uh, competing in tournaments uh, in the United States or abroad. And then at the youth level, there really wasn't anything. So we ended up creating uh, several of the largest leagues in the entire country, hands down. Uh, the Ottawa Carlton uh, Futsal League, the uh, Old Toronto Futsal League, uh, the uh, LF saint over uh, down in Montreal, and uh, you know many others that are developing now uh, over in Western Canada. And there's even, um, you know, the, the, big, the big thing for us is getting this into the schools. Uh, that's our, our big target because we feel that if futsal doesn't get into the schools, uh, it will not reach its maximum potential. Um, and you have to incorporate that uh, at all levels. So at the, you know, youngest of ages, you know, five, six, seven, eight years old, you know, to develop those initial skills. Um, and also, you know, you have high school competitions and then we eventually want to see university competitions. Um, and there is a province uh, in Alberta, uh, they have what's called the uh, Alberta uh, Collegiate uh, Athletics Conference in which they have men's and women's futsal where it's done in a tournament format. So that's what we want to see uh, happen all across this country. And of course, the big thing that uh, ticks off a lot of marks is developing female futsal. Uh, so we've brought a lot of uh, females that are uh, very involved in the game over here, because who better to make decisions for, you know, women in futsal than women themselves. Um, and ultimately, that's, uh, you know, some of the projections we've been able to do is developing some clubs, uh, building leagues across the country. Um, and, you know, our referee committee and coaching committee is, uh, in my opinion, uh, the best of any futsal organization uh, across Canada. Uh, we partner up with quite a few people in the United States. Uh, we did an agreement with the CBFS in Brazil back in 2014. And our whole thing is just to increase education, uh, awareness, and of course, participation at all levels levels, whether it's young, old, recreation or competitive. Um, and that's kind of essentially, uh, you know, what's been the building blocks. And of course, COVID has gotten the way of a lot of different things. But uh, I think when you're so passionate and surrounded by people who are so passionate about the sport, um, it's really just going into second or third gear. And as soon as these restrictions are lifted, we go back into fifth gear and accelerate it, uh, similar to what uh, you find folks in Trinidad and Tobago are doing. And that's that's well said, that's well put together. So I can see that your strategic plan and the execution of said is very much um, amazing in, in, more, in, in, in simplest format to be able to express. In terms of COVID, I, I, you mentioned said, how has COVID assisted in the development of the things, all things uh, for South Canada? I think um, the COVID... I don't think it's assisted more than it's been a negative for obvious reasons. I think uh, revenues have gone down, registrations have gone down. Um, you know, the, the kids are sitting at home. Uh, in Canada right now, um, in our province of Ontario, uh, this past Thursday, uh, they announced that it will be a four-week lockdown. So you couldn't, you couldn't play futsal for pretty much the last, you know, 14-odd months over here. No team sports are allowed, and you're only allowed to go to the pharmacy or the grocery store or for a basic walk for exercise. And when you put people in their homes and, you know, we're, we're, we're a human species that grew up in the outdoors. You know, we evolved in the outdoors. Um, as comforting as it is to, you know, sit and watch some Netflix or to watch, uh, you know, some Futsal 868 videos, uh, you know, we're meant to be outdoors and, and yeah. playing and engaging and socializing. And so it's really stifled the growth, um, not just of futsal, but of sport across the country. And it's it's been very disappointing to see. But at the same time, you know, anytime you have a negative, uh, you have to try to do your best to turn it into a positive. So you know, we work on a strategic plan and, you know, everyone likes to put a five-year plan together. And it's great to do that. But, you know, the world and the sport changes within those five years drastically. So we're always looking to tinker, you know, year after year and saying, we make a plan, let's stick with it, but let's see what we can add or take away what would benefit the, the projects and, and the objectives overall. And so we've been able to really focus on the female development side and building those committees. And I, I hate using the word committees so much because it's always just, well, here's our recommendations, but the decision makers, you know, tell you yes or no. Yes. And I've always been a believer strongly um, that futsal should be built by futsal experts um, for us, by us. That's my philosophy in the game. Um, and I believe that, you know, there's a lot of futsal people not being utilized all across the world um, that I think uh, their respective regions or FAs should utilize in order to accelerate it. You know, there's a lack of human resources to begin with, a lack of revenue. But if everyone comes collectively together, uh, regardless of affiliation, uh, regardless of philosophy, you know, 
everybody can see the sport benefit across the board. Um, so we've been able to focus on a lot of conversations, uh, particularly, as I said, about female development, but also incorporating the Indigenous communities here in Canada, which are a very strong part of our heritage. And ultimately, you know, they have a phenomenal story where, you know, they've been playing since, you know, the, the late 70s or early 80s um, on the different, uh, you know, reservations across the country. Um, you know, Indigenous futsal has an exceptionally rich history um, over here in Canada. And, and we're actually in development to do uh, two major projects. One was more media focused. And the second is to actually integrate them into the FIFA system. Uh, get some equipment out to them and, you know, get them uh, to, you know, come over to different competitions and travel and do different stuff. Uh, there's phenomenal guys uh, like Daniel Thorpe, uh, Carlos Mateus, and a whole bunch of people out in BC, uh, up in uh, Northern Ontario. Uh, there's a lot of great, uh, you know, workers there uh, trying to make it happen as well. So our, our philosophy overall is let's make futsal for everyone. Um, and we do that. We incorporate them. We do not care what your background is, what your skin color is, religion, orientation. We're all about, if you love futsal, hey, come sit down at the table and break some bread with us. Let's talk. Totally respect and understand that. So with that being said, can you give us the number of clubs as well as the number of kids that you have that is a part of Futsal Canada? Right now, we're sitting over 4,000 uh, registered members out there. And uh, with the clubs, uh, the clubs all really depend on the league out there. And some clubs are soccer specific clubs and and some clubs are soccer futsal you know they just do it as a developmental tool as you know some people hate to use that word uh but ultimately the clubs now you're sitting uh close to uh, just about over 350 or so uh, across the country but we would like to take that to a thousand uh within the next 24 months we think would be ideal and ultimately we'd like to integrate them into the system with canada soccer uh, which is of course a separate organization but is the governing body under fifa's game um we could have gone and done some amf we could have gone and done our own thing like many other nations have uh due to their frustrations with the F but we have open dialogue and conversations uh, with staff and the board of directors um, in trying to bridge that gap because we believe at the end of the day, um, you know, if everyone is under the FA and helps build the foundation for futsal for them, that, you know, ultimately that will lead to reinvestment back into the sport. And they need the reinvestment heavily because in Canada, uh, what happens is indoor soccer, um, money does not go to the National Federation. It's only for the outdoor game. So our, and, and we have a lot, of course, you know, we have the big hockey and winter season out here and everybody loves to play indoor, you know, whether it's, you know, on the court in a gym recreationally, whether it's uh, competitive inside one of the many uh, artificial turf dome facilities that we have in the country. And, you know, we said, you know, everyone's talking about, you know, a lack of revenue for futsal. And we said, well, here's a simple solution. Why don't you start getting money? from all the registrations from indoor. You take, let's say even hypothetically and conservatively speaking, a dollar from every indoor registered yeah. kid in this country. Well, you have a nice chunk of change to start and invest in various programs out there. Um, but I also believe the programs should be um, worked together with futsal experts as opposed to be putting uh, being put together by soccer experts. And the reason is, I mean, would you have Roger Federer coaching your national badminton team just because he can swing a racket? No, absolutely not. It's different sport, different rules, different regulations, and different expertise. Um, and that's why I believe every FA across the world should be working with a futsal-specific organization within their nation in order to accelerate the growth at both the grassroots and the professional level. And I totally agree with you in terms of academic development, um, theoretical development, human capacity building through uh, futsal-specific individuals is very important and you made you hit the nail on the head competence and competency building is extremely important and other persons don't understand that first and foremost you are coming with the, the, the notion that sport is supposed to be volunteerism right and you're putting persons who are volunteers into our organizational setup who may not even understand the business of sport more so being specific to the variant of the game of football, such as futsal, and let's add our brother, beat soccer into the conversation, and then you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna add so much of a different dimensions. Football has its own structure. Football has its own demons. Football has its own success stories. But also, football has its, has a lot of gatekeepers. 
that keeps, in some regards, development of the sport in different jurisdictions. In, in your experiences as regards to going and eating bread, breaking bread with persons all around the world who have been inclusive in sharing of knowledge and sharing of information for the growth of the sport of futsal globally is fascinating by itself. Thus, as you keep saying, it's very important that we get these individuals spread across the world whilst assisting developing new ones to be able to help grow the sport in every single Emmy that FIFA, that is a part of FIFA. So I totally agree with you. Competency and competency building is something I I, am, I, am, I, I, I always speak about because it's something that I, I the, 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 the Futsal Association of Trent Tobago worked hard to be able to ensure from the top down that everyone is able to speak the language, speak the sport, and speak development of said. So I agree with you totally. With that being said, my, my next question to you is, what are the success stories of Futsal Canada? For us, I think the, the big thing was bringing together the first real uh, national championships. Um, you know, we had, you know, a couple of, you know, national championships where it was, you know, one or two teams, you know, playing each other or, you know, four teams going to one province. And, you know, it's a nice start to see from an FA standpoint. But, you know, we were going to events and we were seeing the lines were marked incorrectly. And, you know, you know, the, the goals were foldable goals and stuff. I remember the first, you know, so-called tournament I went to, it was uh, they were using a slightly deflated size five soccer ball. And I'm going, that ain't futsal. <laughs> So, you know, for us, we, we got everyone together and, and we have a very diverse cast of uh, great uh, characters and, and uh, builders. I like to call people builders. Some people say promoters, but, you know, when you're actually laying the tape on the line, you're waking up at 6 a.m. to bring in those nets, you're a builder. When you're doing it voluntarily and you're going out, you know, and talking to the parents, the coaches, the technical directors of those clubs and academies, you're a builder. And so we have some great builders, uh, you know, like Edward Orellana out in Barry, uh, Alex Fletcher and Phil Benavides out in Kingston, Alex Kino, uh, who created the LF Sanka and is actually now the head coach of the Haitian national team. Uh, so Alex is a great friend. I know he's tuning in right now as well. And, uh, you know, is looking forward to, you know, seeing everyone from TNT in Canada at that tournament and, uh, you know, builders all across the entire country. Um, you know, everybody, I've mentioned BC a few times um, and it starts, you know, not just in the boardroom, but on the court as well and, and in the dressing room. And so, I mean, our coaches uh, with our program, we got Geraldo Ferrari out in Alberta, who's one of the best coaches in North America, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Jaime Meza, uh, Edward uh, Orlane, I mentioned earlier, him and Jaime actually trained with Fernando Ferretti, uh, the famed Brazilian coach, uh, you know, coach Magnus, uh, coached Brazil's national team. So, you know, our people are hungry to get education. You, you said a phenomenal word is academic. Um, and it's very important for education to be created and developed. Uh, we keep hearing Soccer Canada is developing a futsal license, um, you know, that's going to be, you know, across the board, which is going to be great. But we want to make sure that it's not just, you know, futsal, you know, baby steps. We want to make sure that it's a, you know, and, and see that it's a proper futsal, you know, coaching education system and with input from actual experienced futsal coaches. That's super vital uh, for so many reasons, obviously. Um, but the, the major successes I find was a bringing everybody together uh, philosophically out there, I think bringing people from the AMF slash FIFA system uh, into FIFA was a big thing. Uh, but the national championships uh, that we started in 2014, uh, we got Queen's University uh, over in the lovely city of Kingston, Ontario. Um, and we we did it for a few years, uh, had a broadcast deal, uh, had sponsors. Uh, we had a U18 championship, which in my opinion was probably the most exciting futsal to watch in the entire country. You know, the kids are fighting for pride and trophies and honor. And that's the, you know, that's what I love about sport. Forget the money side. It's, uh, you know, these young kids is the most exciting part of futsal to watch. Um, and ultimately, you know, the CSA, Canada Soccer Association said, you know, we're, we're going to do our own national championships doing here. And we said, well, you know, we can work together on it and, you know, we can kind of, you know, step aside from this operation here and just focus all the energies. They have a higher budget than us. Um, and they went over to Queen's University as well uh, to continue those national championships. And ultimately, our thing is just making sure that we help with the commentary, the setup of the courts. You know, we have a lot of officials in Futsal Canada uh, in that tournament that we're very proud of to see moving up the chain. Uh, Chris Grabis is the, you know, first FIFA 
uh, badged, you know, futsal referee that we have in the country. So he's based out in Montreal and has been with us at tournaments. Uh, and of course now, you know, Canada soccer's go-to guy. So little successes for the individual is something that I've liked, but the biggest thing for us, I think is the, the, philo- the philosophical collection of everyone coming together and working to build futsal, not just in the region, but, you know, across Canada together uh, so that, you know, we can benefit the sport at every level. Um, I know that's probably a longer winded answer than you were expecting, but, you know, we're really proud of the work that we've done. And we feel though that at the same time, uh, we can improve drastically on so many things. Um, We're never satisfied. uh, We're never complacent. Um, We always need to drive forward because if we don't do that, the other teams in uh, CONCACAF are going to accelerate and, um, you know, beat us in years if we don't step it up. So that's kind of our philosophy is, you know, acknowledge the great work that we've done, but at the same time, make sure that we're pushing harder and not resting on our laurels. And that's so great because as our tagline says, hashtag stronger together. It's very important to ensure that all stakeholders on the same vision and work towards building the sport of futsal in the country. So I'm totally in agreement with what you're saying, which leads me to the other question. What are the opportunities for growth of futsal in Canada? Oh, I think there's such a tremendous growth trajectory available out there. And and again, it's all it's all really, in my opinion, if you're AMF, uh, your Futsal Canada, your, you know, uh, unregulated or, you know, unaffiliated league is what I like to call them. People like to say the word rogue. I hate that because it has such a negative connotation behind it. I believe that, you know, you have to get value for your money. You know, you have parents who are working hard, you know, paying for their kids to play games that they love. And they need to see value for that. They need to see coaching. They need to see refing. They need to see development. Um, but to answer your question, uh, I think the biggest opportunity for growth in Canada uh, is in the female game. Uh, you have, you know, half of your population, uh, in my opinion, right now being ignored. Um, and more importantly, the women's national team outperforms our men's national team uh, in the soccer realm. You know, people, we have superstars over here like Kadisha Buchanan, uh, who, you know, played futsal at the Brams United program under Peter Arconda, who was a phenomenal uh, builder of uh, soccer in the women's game uh, out in Brampton, Ontario. And, you know, Christine Sinclair, all these superstars in the women's game. And I'm sitting here going, how are we not utilizing these amazing stars, these humble, phenomenal athletes that young girls all across the country are looking up to? How do, we, how do we utilize this to build futsal? Um, and you got to do games, you got to do out, go clinics and go across the board. And, and the female thing, I think, is number one uh, in our book. Number two is getting it into the schools. Uh, and, and I can hammer that, you know, for the next hour of how beneficial it is to get futsal in the schools. And, and I don't think a single person involved in futsal would disagree that schools is such an imperative part of the development of the game. And I think that if we were to Uh, get the funding because we know that schools over here in Canada, you know, for the reputation that our country has for being, you know, wealthy and and rich, um, you know, we still have the same budgetary restrictions and and problems that anywhere else in the world has, you know, we're a little more fortunate, of course, and we certainly recognize that. But we feel that if we're able to help develop funds, and invest, you know, expertise, and get futsal into the curriculum, we feel that the low bounce ball uh, results in less injuries. Uh, we believe it results in uh, better technical uh, development, um, and it develops in uh, less damage in hitting the lights when the ball. You know, we use this big green bouncy tennis ball. If you can imagine a giant tennis ball, uh, the size of a soccer ball, that's what is used in schools right now for you know soccer uh, in in the classes. And our thing is, well, why don't we get every school in this country a set of futsal balls? Um, and, you know, develop them that way. So that way, you know, they're keeping their legs down, keeping the ball inside the, the boundary lines and developing the way that, you know, they're doing over in Spain and Brazil and Portugal. Um, so those are the two biggest aspects I see is building the female game and building the schools. Of course, there's talk of professional leagues and stuff like that, but we're such a massive geographic, uh, you know, landmass, you know, we're the second largest country geographically after Russia. So to have a professional league, um, it is extremely difficult. Uh, I don't think it's feasible whatsoever. Um, we just have the new Canadian Premier League, you know, for outdoor, and we had ownership come in there. So that league's been around for now, what, I think, uh, you know, it's going on its third season, and unfortunately, COVID's gotten in the way of that, and I'm a big supporter of the Canadian Premier League. I want to see it succeed. Uh, eventually, I'd like to see the Canadian Premier Futsal League. 
you know, go across the country. But we know that's such a far reached goal right now without significant uh, investments in the millions of dollars. And, you know, where I see the advantages of a national league would be in countries like Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, personally, I'd like to see a Caribbean Super League. Um, for years, uh, you know, I, I have talked to all my friends over here from, you know, Jamaica. We have some Cuban friends, you know, Trini friends, Guyanese friends. And I just sat there and said, you know, we have such a massive, you know, diaspora over here of, of Caribbean players. Imagine what it would be like to have a league going down. And everybody said, if they got a Super League eventually in the Caribbean, we'd like to go down and play in it and represent. Um, of course, you know, if they were good, we'd like them to play for Canada. But, uh, you know, realistically, we think that if you have a smaller country, it's a little easier to do a pro league, um, you know, unless you have a significant amount of money, such as the Russian League, which is one of the best leagues on the planet. Uh, it is phenomenally marketed. It is entertaining to watch. Um, and, you know, they got the money for it. But does Canada have that? No. So if the professional game is to be built, I think the best way to do that is to not have a domestic National League, but to incorporate uh, with the United States the same way that we do with the National Hockey League, uh, the National Basketball League, the NBA, Major League Baseball, etc. I think that's uh, ultimately uh, the, the way to go on that professional side. But for now, female development and schools, number one, two and three. Totally agree with you and, and understand that because it's the same thing with uh, futsal in Trinidad and Tobago. And just to be able to, to show it, showcase it as in terms of our strategic plan, it's right there. Uh, grassroots coaching training, female inclusivity, performance, and brand building. So we totally share the same sentiment when it comes to um, including female inclusivity, having female inclusivity in, in, in part of the strategic plan. And also grassroots development includes our schools because we have the Let's Play Futsal Caravan where we go into schools and promote the game. Our next step, as always, just as you said, is to be able to have leagues and competitions. And he's, as you speak about the Canadian uh, Premier League, shout out to Mr. Stephen Hart, uh, Trinbegonian, of course, who is the uh, head coach of the Halifax FC. And um, great job that he's doing across in Halifax in terms of developing that their brand and their, 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 soccer, their soccer work. So definitely, as you rightfully said, um, and stay tuned as regards to the fact that you may be hearing some things of the Caribbean not too, not, not too far distant future. <laughs> Can't speak much to it right now. But um, just let, let's let it be known that uh, Futsal 868 Corner Talks is on the pulse of, of things when it comes to the Caribbean. And, and, and we, we may have a few things in store. So definitely get the guys ready. Come on down. We, we welcome you all to be a part of, of all things Futsal in the Caribbean and some, you know, some great Caribbean food as always. Um, we have it right here. But Chris, we'll be right back. We're going to take a quick break because right after the break, we're going to discuss futsal in CONCACAF. We have the big championship coming up just now. Let's have some discussion as you guys that. Let's hear your thoughts. Let's see your predictions as you guys uh, would kind of come out of their, their group. What are you thinking? We'll be right back. You're watching Futsal 860 Corner Talks. Episode 47 with Chris Fernandez. We'll be right back. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to announce that the Cleopatra Burrell Foundation will be partnering with Futsal 868 on their virtual race challenge to stop violence against women.
and that's our virtual race, which is actually extended from April the 5th until June the 4th. And Chris, we'll send you some information. It's virtual. It could be done even in Canada. So we welcome Futsal Canada to be a part of said. And it's for a good cause. It's uh, violence against women. I uh, want to be able to have that discussion. So, you know, we'll send you information. Hope to be able to have uh, Futsal Canada be a part of the discussion and also participation. And um, feel free to send us that kind of activity as well down our way, whereby we could be able to send some pictures and videos off to Canada to show support in terms of anything that you all do. We definitely would like to have you all uh, be a part of that venture with us. Well, and we let me, before you go on, I have to say this is one of the absolute best initiatives I've seen ever with Futsal out there. Um, I was raised by my grandmother, uh, my single mother. I have four aunts and I'm raising, I have two young sisters as well. Uh, and I've been raising my two nieces out there. And I can tell you right now, uh, you know, you, you have an issue of domestic assault, you know, against women is a very big problem. Um, and for us, uh, if I wasn't working uh, in sport and, and in my work, uh, I would definitely be putting my energies towards, um, you know, stopping domestic violence uh, against women. Uh, so, and when I saw that commercial i'm like i can't wait till he comes back on and you know i can big up that program because anybody out there who's listening um you know everyone knows someone who's been affected by that and i think it's a phenomenal initiative and to have futsal involved uh you have to just give absolutely a pat on the back to everyone at futsal 868 and all the partners involved uh and you have my word i'll make sure everyone gets that on social media and see what we can do to encourage more participation really 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 phenomenal thing you guys are doing there Really appreciate that, uh, uh, Chris. Really, I appreciate that because we recognize that, as 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 the former South African Prime Minister said, um, Nelson Mandela, sport is a reflection of society. It is it is true sport that we can see a difference and a change. And this is one of the the four causes that the Futsal Association of Trinidad Tobago Futsal Eight Six Eight is driving home because we cannot not because it's a pandemic we are going to sit down and do nothing. We have to be able to be the voice of the voiceless and continue to be able to see how the brand, the sport, and the people associated with the brand can be able to make somebody's life better. And I am appreciative of the fact that you can be able to share those words with us because it's very much a scourge and we are going to try our utmost best to make it, to, to do better for, for someone, anyone, and everyone. It's all about giving back, and, and that's such a oh. phenomenal job. I honestly, I almost have a tear in my eye watching it. So I'm, I'm just going to pretend like I'm eating onions right now, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> most definitely, most definitely. Um, but let's see if it is we go back to, to to futsal, because I mean, yes, domestic violence against women, and, and yes, you know, we're doing it. And 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 with that being said, Chris, I am going to challenge you and futsal Canada to find initiatives, social initiatives that you all can speak to in terms of your 3,000 children. Um, 3,000 children, which multiply that by two. That's 6,000 parents, yeah, that can be able to drive any of the causes that you all have, have chosen in, to get that message out there. Let's see how best we can be able to have a snowfall effect, a domino effect when it comes to seeing futsal being an agent, a positive agent of change throughout the world. I think I'm going to be at that challenge. I'm going to have that challenge to everybody else who comes on for the rest of the year. So let's see if it is we can keep it going. I love it. I love it. Let's make it happen. Definitely. So moving on, I'm going to put up a picture. And, and for the sake of, of, of marketing, as you know, we will not necessarily mention the name of the championship, but we all know what it's about, right? So we're just going to put, put, put up the picture and... There has been some changes as regards to the championship that will be held the next month. And um, so for Sal 868, we decided to do a graphical representation of said to be able to highlight exactly what's have been happening. So we have the four groups and Canada is in group C with Costa Rica and Haiti. Trinidad is in group a with Guatemala and now the Dominican Republic, given the fact that three countries have left the tournament. Again, let's go to Group C for the first one in this, this discussion Costa Rica, 
Canada and Haiti. Chris, tell me your expectations. Well, I've been following this championship, uh, all the developments for the last year plus. Um, I was supposed to actually be the play-by-play -play and color commentator for the tournament uh, for CONCACAF, but COVID has these empty arenas going in and uh, the broadcasts are going to be done remotely, uh, professionally, as CONCACAF always does. Uh, you know, Christian Fernandez, uh, Christian Salas, and everybody involved, um, you know, they could have punched it in. They could have canceled this tournament the same way that the AFC did. And the AFC is a serious hotbed of futsal. Um, but, you know, when they canceled their tournament, a lot of people were opening their eyes and a lot of people were saying, no, CONCACAF's going to cancel, you know, if the AFC did. But no, all the credit to the people in Guatemala and Miami that made this thing happen. Every single one of them deserves a pat on the back. They're all behind the scenes workers. They get no respect, no love uh, from the general public. But I know for a fact uh, how hard uh, those guys were working out there. So, you know, to not only have the tournament go from 20 teams down to 16, which I think is the sweet spot. 16 would have been perfectly ideal. But because of COVID, um, you know, we see now Guadeloupe, um, Martinique, um, French Guiana, um, you know, coming out. And it was just something where, you know, it was a big surprise, not too surprising, but it was a surprise to a lot of people. And now you have 13 teams and kind of an uneven schedule, particularly for Group D. Uh, and, the, and the team I feel the most for is Trinidad out there because Trinidad had a, a great, you know, opportunity, I think, uh, in my opinion, to achieve that second place position. Uh, Guatemala, I think, is the heavy favorite uh, overall to win the tournament with the amount of games they've played. Uh, they went down to Brazil. Um, and they didn't go to, to play around. They went to play Magnus. You know, they went to play some heavy under 23 players. And I've been there. You know, I've, I've sat down with Falcao and Ferretti in their arena watching these you know, young kids play. The, these are some of the best footballers on the planet. And Guatemala said, we don't care who they are. We want to go test ourselves and then bring that back over to CONCACAF. So I think Guatemala should take that group. But I, I really feel bad now because from Group C, they took the Dominican Republic out and inserted them into your group in group a um and the dominican it's a very very quiet little country not one not too many people are talking about them uh but a, a good friend of ours tony Torello out in new york said you know they got four guys in the spanish second division and they got a coach um an argentinian who led the their youth program i, I think it was involved uh the 2018 youth olympics uh, when connie and otto were doing the trinidad thing um this coach was involved there and working with uh, Diego, the World Cup winning coach, now working in Spain. So the Dominicans, that quiet little team that's just, you know, waiting for the opportunity to come in. And uh, whoever wins that game between uh, Trinidad and Dominican, I think, uh, you know, is going to get that uh, elusive opportunity in the quarterfinal to get that World Cup spot. So, um, you know, I'm excited to see Group A, to be perfectly honest, because who knows what's going to happen there. You, you're quite correct, because initially Group D was the group of death. And last week we had Stephen McGettigan from Futsal Focus, and we were looking at the the original 16 team format. And um, as you rightfully said, we said, okay, well, it looked like Trinidad and Tobago and Guatemala will be going out. But you did a great analysis as regards to now the chances of, which puts a, a lot of pressure now on on on, on Coach Connie. And his technical team, as you guys said, because the Dominican Republic, um, as you rightfully say, has been very quiet extremely quiet and um steven um added to your sentiments by speaking to because he did us a piece for self focus did a piece on dominican republic so let's see what happens and uh press still goes out to to team tto as we are known in terms of the soca warriors for south soca warriors so we really hope to see let's let's see what happens from there let's talk about group c group c being costa rica canada and haiti Ooh. You know, I, right now I feel like there's a juicy steak in front of me and I'm just I'm just licking my chops at this because, you know, Canada, we've worked a, a long time. You know, a lot of the, the players on the national team in, in 2016 and 2012, you know, came through the leagues that we created. And, and there's players on this team that are, you know, with our leagues. And we're excited to see where we're at. Um, we played Costa Rica in two exhibition games down in Costa Rica in San Jose uh, about in 2019. and you know, we did very, very well against them, very well. And in the 2016 tournament, Costa Rica hosted, of course, um, in the opening game. 
And, you know, it was the first game was Costa Rica, Canada. And everyone was thinking, ah, Costa Rica is going to run over Canada. But everyone on that team, uh, whether it was coaches, players, physiotherapists, the people behind the scenes like myself, we knew. We're like, oh, we're going to give anybody a game here. Make no mistake. And we lost three to two. But it wasn't the loss. It was the, the respect that, you know, the fans in Costa Rica gave. And I was in the arena. And you could see the people going, all right, Canada. Okay, you guys got some game. Let's let's go. So we felt a little bit of pride with that. Um, and, and that was after eliminating the United States, you know, very formidable team. Um, and the confidence of Canada was riding sky high. Um, unfortunately, we're not allowed to do too many practices over here because of the COVID restrictions. So we were kind of stifled in, in this element. But there's a couple of key twists is, you know, the history with Costa Rica, Canada. It's very friendly, but also very competitive. But the, as I said earlier, Alex Quinola, a great friend of ours uh, over from the Montreal Laval region, um, he is the coach of the Haitian national team. And he's also from the same city as the Canadian national team coach. So there's a little bit of a rivalry there. I think, uh, you know, nobody's friends until this tournament's over again. Uh, but, you know, to, to have two Canadian coaches in this tournament, uh, we feel is a, a really cool uh, key marker of, uh, you know, the organizations, uh, you know, working together to build it. So in my opinion, I mean, I, I it, it's going to be difficult to see Canada defeat Costa Rica. And I hate to say that because I'm, I'm a very proud Canadian, but Costa Rica is able to go freely to train, to practice. They're doing exhibition games. Um, if I'm not mistaken, they're doing a little exhibition game with the team you're very familiar with coming up too. So, uh, you know, I won't say too much there, but, uh, you know, they're going to get some games in and Canada has to come out, um, you know, with the best fitness and the best tactics available to, you know, succeed them. Do I think Canada defeats Haiti? Yes, I do. And I'm sorry, Alex, I know you're watching, but I, I got to stick with the uh, the red and white over here, brother. So uh, I, I do see Costa Rica finishing first, uh, although I hope I can put the salt and pepper on my shoe and stick it in my mouth and Canada finishes top of the group. But uh, I think uh, Haiti, unfortunately, uh, in this three team group is going to be the odd team out. I decided to put the car before the horse in terms of speaking to the championship and not speaking in terms of um the development of, of futsal in CONCACAF because I wanted to hear your commentator voice come in to the free. Uh, <laughs> um, with that being said, let's let's speak development of the sport of futsal in CONCACAF. Your thoughts, your expressions of said. I think more needs to be done. I think a lot more needs to be done. Um, the president of CONCACAF is a gentleman named Victor Montaliani. Victor played futsal uh, in the 80s and 90s, and uh, he came over for um, an Italian-Canadian uh, uh, 50th anniversary celebration in Toronto a few years ago. And, you know, he calls up a friend of ours, Dino Rossi, uh, who we feel is one of the best, you know, soccer or futsal workers in all of Canada. And Dino's like, the, the president of Canada Soccer uh, wants to play futsal on Sunday. Can you organize it? We're like, what do you mean? He wants to play or he wants to watch? No, he wants to play we're like, listen, if the president of the Federation wants to play futsal, you bet your bottom dollar that we're going to make it happen. So <laughs> Victor comes out uh, and, and we had a mix. We, we had a mix of national team players, referees, coaches. You know, it was, it was recreational, but nice, low key. You know, he didn't want anything flashy, uh, which we always respect. Victor comes out and scores two goals on the national starting goalie, Josh Lamos at the time. Uh, three minutes after scoring his second goal, Josh comes out of his net. Uh, Victor steps on his leg. <laughs> Josh, Josh looks like he broke his leg and you just see the look on his face. I really hope I didn't injure our national goalkeeper. So we kind of call that the, the futsal hat trick here in Canada as a little inside joke. But now Victor has moved up from being the president uh, of Canada soccer to CONCACAF, which is the first time it's ever happened. Um, and we feel that, you know, a guy with his futsal experience and his energy. I mean, if you think I, I have energy to, to, to spend, you know, Victor is, you know, always ready to go every single time uh, that I've met him. And I think that, you know, he needs to, you know, really push the envelope, um, you know, with everybody in CONCACAF and saying, hey, we don't just want to have futsal on our menu. Let's be a leader in it. Uh, because Victor is a big leader. Uh, he's very influential at FIFA being one of the vice presidents. And I think that CONCACAF, in my personal opinion, needs to follow UEFA's development model. Um, I think UEFA, out of any organization in the world, is the undisputed leader in futsal uh, with their women's, their U19 development, 
the uh, UEFA Futsal Champions League. I mean, it's a dream come true. Um, and I'd like to see CONCACAF become that next um, confederation in order to uh, get those developments. Where would we see those developments? Well, for starters, let's get the coaching licenses out from CONCACAF, the same way that you have your UEFA A, uh, the same way that you have your level one, two, and three with AFC, uh, the CBFS and, and other countries, um, you know, in South America, you know, have their own programming too. Um, and we need to see that happen from the confederation. Um, you know, from a referee standpoint, you know, there's quite a few excellent refs in CONCACAF. Um, you know, Sergio Cabrera is a, a phenomenal example. We have our Canadian Chris Grabis who got his license and he's going to, you know, get a first taste of his games at CONCACAF in Guatemala. But we need more. We don't just need a handful. We need we need we need a, a whole bucket, you know, full of, uh, you know, futsal uh, experts in, in these fields. And I think CONCACAF needs to invest in these coaching, these refing and youth development programs. Um, and, and I think ultimately, if they were to do that and increase the competitions, firstly, bringing back the club championship for futsal, because that's been missing for quite a while, um, you know, I think we'll be on a good start to move forward there. But we, we have to have high expectations because if we're aiming too low, why are we spending our energy in the first place? Let's go high, let's go fifth gear, and let's make it happen. There's enough futsal experts across CONCACAF uh, to make all of those objectives, coaching, refing, uh, development, inclusion, uh, and branding. It, it, it really isn't rocket science. We know what the formula is. You certainly do, because I've seen uh, you know, your program and I've seen uh, you know, your graphics that you're showing earlier. You know what it takes. The United States knows what it takes. And we have more than a few people here in Canada uh, that believe in the same. And of course, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Panama, and all those other ever, ever hit ears as well. But we need to get out to Bermuda. We need to get out to Jamaica. We need to get out uh, to some of the smaller nations. And we need to make um, you know, CONCACAF one of the biggest leaders in futsal. And so if anyone from CONCACAF's listening, take it as a challenge, but not a challenge in a negative way. You know, everyone's there. We want to see it happen. We're hungry. We're thirsty for it. You know, let's make CONCACAF one of the hottest regions in the world for futsal. I stare at you intensely on the screen because I'm really impressed of the fact that you challenged the president of CONCACAF and the entire CONCACAF to do better for futsal. Many persons would have been political as regards to answering that question. Chris, thank you. I'm, I'm from the bottom of my heart, thank you, because we need to have honest, open discussions in terms of, as you rightfully said, not being mediocre, but challenging the juggernauts of futsal globally and being better than them. As I was speaking to Stephen last week, the Caribbean region is poised well for futsal and beach soccer development, given the, 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 the SWOT analysis that has been done years ago. Um, and thus, CONCACAF can assist with the development of these, of, of, of even a lower budget sport. Everybody speaks about football and the popularity of football because it's a low budget sport. You just need a ball and that's it. Futsal is even, is even greater because you need less players. Yeah, you need any, any, any concrete surface would work for the development of said. That's what happens in Brazil. So the Caribbean, from a Caribbean standpoint, it is very much island states can be able to use, can be used to have the development of futsal and beach soccer. And with that being said, I am really, really, really thankful that you can be able to challenge CONCACAF um, on this show um, to be able to do better because we really need to do better. And I'm also more impressed in the fact that from a CONCACAF standpoint, everyone is willing to help another individual. And that is fantastic. And let's put it this way. You have the support from the, the Mexicans who says they totally agree. <laughs> they totally agree. So, you know, we have to continue to do our part. We definitely have to continue to do our part as regards the development of the sport in CONCACAF. And we, we definitely would, Chris. I know that you and I will have some, some more conversations um, and bring in the other stakeholders as regards to what we can do to be able to build the sport of futsal in the CONCACAF region. 
We're going to take a quick break again and we'll come back to Chris Fernandez, director at Futsal Canada, on episode 47 of Futsal 868 Corner Talks. What a wonderful show it has been. Thank you very much, Chris. We'll be right back with your closing remarks. Hi, good day. This is Kareem Perry. Now finish one of my personal workouts, and I just wanted to say from the National Men's Futsal Team, thank you very much, Little Z, for being our number one sponsor. We really appreciate it. Futsal 868 keeps moving with Lucas 8, of course. Chris, your closing remarks, sir. Well, firstly, I'm sitting here drinking water like a sucker, and I'm sitting there watching that delicious Lucozade commercial. <laughs> now I just now I really want one out there, and I'm gonna start doing some exercises like Kareem and be a be a super a superhuman. Maybe I'll get a get my exactly. Maybe I'll get in a Marvel movie. <laughs> that never gonna happen. <laughs> But no, it's uh, it's it's great. I love the commercials and the the, the thing with the uh, domestic uh, violence issue. Phenomenal stuff. I, I can't wait to get that out to my people and, and get this going. Um, you know, with closing remarks, I got to be honest. This Concacaf tournament can't come soon enough. I'm I'm thinking of what these games are going to be like. You know, Group D is going to be real fun out there with USA and Cuba, and I think there's going to be quite a few surprises from a few teams. I think uh, ultimately these quarterfinals is what everybody's aiming for. And then once you get that World Cup ticket, going for the title of CONCACAF champion uh, is going to be, uh, you know, icing on the cake. But right now I see the U.S. going forward with Guatemala, uh, you know, very, very far. Um, and hopefully I'd love to see Canada get in and get one of those spots. And of course, you know, if TNT gets there, I think, uh, you know, the, the head of state of Trinidad and Tobago should uh, get Connie a nice beach house uh, with a wing that he can invite me to so I can enjoy some of that beautiful soca and uh, nice food down there. So that's kind of what I'm waiting for, my friend. Most definitely. I mean, if, if, if Connie pulls it off, I am telling you, I am telling you, I'm telling you, he is, I mean, you, you definitely, you'll be on a plane coming down. He's going to call everyone. You know that. Connie's going to call everyone. He's going to say, party in Trinidad and Tobago. We got the government on lock. Come on down, guys. Let's have some a, a full soaker party. As we say in the crib in Trinidad and Tobago, he's going to have a Zessa event. He is definitely going to do it. So, <laughs> can, can you do me one favor? If Connie, If Connie makes it. If Connie makes it, can you make him dress up in one of those costumes for a carnival? Wow. All right. So <laughs> I don't think I'm, anyone I'm, wants I'm, to see hold that. On, hold on, hold on. I need you to challenge him right now. So I'm gonna put you on solo screen and I'm gonna let you challenge Connie. Okay, Connie, your good friend here from Toronto. You were my FIFA instructor at the course in Montreal. We talk quite a lot and we're both friends of Joffrey. So listen, my friend, if you qualify for the world cup not only do i challenge you to dress up in one of the traditional costumes for carnival i'll sweeten the pot i will personally come down and dress up in one with you and we can march together what's that? i'm gonna have to get some suntan lotion before i even consider it <laughs> But it's great. I love to see it. If it happens, I think it would be a huge thing for TNT. This is, this is amazing. I, I'm definitely going to get the media team to take that aspect of the show 
and I'm going to do a video with it. I'm going to send it to Futsal Canada, send it to Connie. <laughs> Let's make it into a proper challenge. <laughs> Chris Fernandez, it. it has been a pleasure. It has been an utmost pleasure to be able to speak to you all things Futsal. I mean, speaking to you in person versus speaking to you on, on, on the phone, WhatsApp, you are a total bundle of Futsal joy. And I totally enjoy this evening with you. It's, it has been an utmost pleasure, brother. Thank you very much. The on behalf of our, on mine. On behalf of our family, with everything that's happening in terms of COVID-19 and this pandemic, we wish God's richest blessings unto you and your family, asking for his protection, um, you know, against all, all, all evil, all harms and danger. And you have a great week ahead. And to the girls, the ladies in your life, please protect them. And uh, we'll be in touch soon. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on and wonderful work you guys are doing there in TNT and the invitation for you guys to come up to Carabana when this thing is all said and done with COVID. That's extended to you and everybody else at the organization. Uh, they want to come up, have a fantastic time out there. And uh, my friend, keep a, the phenomenal job you guys are doing with the show and stay blessed. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Chris. Ciao. We'll definitely be in contact. And that's Chris Fernandez. What an amazing show it has been. Another episode, episode 47. Can you believe that we are three episodes of our 50th? Oof. It felt like just yesterday that we had the idea to be able to have the show. And as we talk about 50th, but one more, which is next week, Sunday, episode 48. Let's, let's, let's tell you all who will be there. No other than Mr. Keith Toza. He will be on part three, uh, the commissioner of the Professional Futsal League out of the USA, a former head coach of the U.S. national futsal team, as known one of the winningest coaches in U.S. indoor soccer um, history. He will be joining us next week, Sunday, the 13th of April at 4 p.m. It will be our utmost pleasure to speak to him. And in our episode 49, we head to Carib the Caribbean. Um, episode 49, we'll be speaking to Futsal in CONCACAF Part 4, where we speak to our Caribbean counterparts, who will give us their perspective once again on the fastest indoor, indoor growing sports in the world, Futsal. So as always, I want to say thank you very much for, for you all, for being a part of this wonderful show. And may you have a great week ahead. Before we leave, we send prayers up to St. Vincent and Grenadines. And this is not just me speaking as a Caribbean counterpart, but my paternal grandparents are from St. Vincent and Grenadines. We have family homes across there. We still have family members across there. Um, to all the Edwards, the Slaters, the Reeds, um, everyone, praise God to you. You know we are in contact with you all. And we pray that, uh, that everything will work out fine. We definitely be supporting it from an organization standpoint. We will be supporting St. Vincent and Grenadines. So to everybody who's looking on, please say a prayer for St. Vincent. Prayers go to them. So once again, we ask each one of you all to have a great week ahead. Sign out another episode of Futsal 86 Corner Talks. Have a good one, guys.